Would you like to meet with Antonio or no? I'm going to be doing my napkin, so give me your business card. I'll make sure that you get information because you have to apply for it.
Valley of Arsene. Assemblywoman Kathleen Pagani from the 17th Assembly District, who chairs the High Speed Rail Select Committee in the State Assembly. Thank you, Senator. Um, I have been interested in this issue for a very long time because I was the author of the legislation that placed Proposition 1A, the High Speed Rail Bond, on the ballot. And last March, our former speaker, Karen Bass, and I, we held a workshop here in Los Angeles with a small, much smaller group, but at that time, we didn't know what the federal requirements were going to be. We were waiting to see if they would dictate to us what we would do in California or whether we had the ability to set up a program here on our own. And now that we know that the federal government is not dictating it, we have the opportunity to work with the authority um, from the ground up to put together a program as we move into the construction phase so that we do ensure that we have small business participation. Uh, my district is in the Central Valley, and 35 minutes away from my district is where the first $5.5 billion is being spent. And in the Central Valley, we have small businesses. We have very few large firms. So in my communities, unless we do have a successful program with the Small Business Enterprise Program, um, my local businesses will not have the opportunity for that work. There's been a, a lot of discussion in my area anyway uh, because they see articles in the press about Jap the Japanese interest and interest from China and all of these other countries. And we're fortunate that we have memorandums of understanding with eight countries that have built successful high-speed rail systems. They will be sharing their technology but we need our, our own California firms to actually do the infrastructure work and hire the workers who will be performing the day-to-day -day jobs. So this is extremely important as we go forward. Um, I, too, have introduced some legislation, and Senator Price and I are working very closely together. Um, he will be developing the business program piece, and I will be developing the oversight and accountability piece. And we know that there are some examples in the state that are better than others. Um, Caltrans has one way of doing things with the Small Business Enterprise Program, but there are other better examples throughout the state. And we're hoping that going forward, the, the authority will take a look at some of those best practices and incorporate those into the program that's ultimately developed that we do use for high-speed rail. And I'm pleased that Thomas Hart from the U.S. High-Speed Rail Association is here as well today. Um, he and I have worked together because I've participated with the association, and he's been interested in this issue for a very long time and is watching it from a federal level. And for us to keep in mind, because there are no other high-speed rail systems in the United States, and California is likely to be the first at this point in time, whatever we do do here, others around the nation are watching. So it is critically important that we do this right, and we, and we have a shining example for the rest of the nation to follow. So thank you to Senator Price and the other, my other colleagues who are here today, and thank you to all of you for participating. Thank you. Uh, and you've certainly been a, uh, a real advocate in this area. So we should really share the whole year as well. Next up, uh, from our neighbor down in Long Beach, uh, <coughs> Senator Al Lowenthal from the 27th Senate District. And last year, he chaired the Senate Select Committee on High Speed Rail. Uh, that committee hasn't been authorized yet. Oh, it has been authorized. He is the current chair of the Senate Select Committee on High Speed Rail, Al Lowenthal. Thank you. Uh, I've been working on this issue for a number of years, since 2007, till this uh, 2011, I chaired the Senate Committee on Transportation and Housing. We held over 10 hearings on High Speed Rail, also on the Budget Subcommittee that oversees the high-speed rail budget in the Senate and makes recommendations to the full budget committee about, about appropriations. I am now also the chair of the California State Senate Select Committee on High-Speed Rail. Uh, and I just want to say that I too am here to learn about the issues about procurement. Uh, I want to show support for uh, 
Uh, and so I braved the long trip from Long Beach to the Science Center uh, because uh, to show uh, support for the person in the California State Legislature who is providing a great leadership on promotion of small businesses uh, and the well-being of the California economy and, uh, and now focusing on procurement practices uh, is very exciting for me who has the responsibility of doing oversight over the high speed rail. It's very exciting for me to be participating and learning just what the specific issues are. Uh, and so I want to thank the Senator for the And from uh, Orange County area, our friend uh, from the 34th Senate District, Lou Correa. Thank you, Senator Weiss. I'm State Senator Lou Correa, and my, my colleague to my right, Mr. Lowenthal. I have also uh, traveled far from Central Orange County, and you got to understand that uh, being an alumni from the school on the other side of town, or UCLA, it's even much more of a challenge for me to come to this point in town and being so close to that other school. And it's so popular because it's the Anaheim team. Well, actually, I, I represent Central Orange County, Home of Disneyland, by the way, the home of the first monorail in the country. <laughs> home to the Anaheim Angels of Anaheim. And soon home to the Anaheim Kings of Anaheim. Yet I gotta tell you, the happiest place on earth is also the place that's probably Central OC. We also happen to have 15 to 20 percent unemployment right now. California right now has a second highest unemployment rate in the country, more than 12 percent, second only to Nevada. And so when I look at the high-speed rail, what I see are taxpayer dollars that need to be spent wisely. And if we do undertake this effort, I think that we can both create a tremendous infrastructure, a tremendous asset for the state of California, and generate jobs. And as a legislator, it's our duty up here to make sure that we do take care of our fiduciary duty, which means to make sure that these dollars, these precious taxpayers' dollars are well spent and they create the jobs that they can create in the state of California. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, proceed to our first panel on the agenda. I'm going to ask each of you to uh, share your knowledge and experience and public contracting in the transportation area, limit your comments to around 10 minutes. I uh, appreciate hearing uh, thoughts you have about problems, obstacles, and solutions uh, as you have, uh, as you go through those issues. Uh, our first speaker is Tom, Thomas Hart, who is VP of Government Affairs and the General Counsel for the U.S. High Speed Rail Association of Washington. Mr. Hart, on behalf of the association, advocates for policy and legislation this includes working with federal, state, elected officials, White House, federal agencies, uh, and many other stakeholders. Uh, Mr. Hart has been asked to share his experiences with the contract and spare his experience at the federal level in other states and the possible in other countries, uh, as well as actions taken or contemplated by the United Mr. Hart. Thank you, Senator Price. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Kathleen. Gaggiani, and thank you, uh, Senator Lowenthal and Senator Correa, uh, for your leadership in this all important issue of, of procurement policies uh, for small business, minority business, women owned business, and, and large business, American businesses. Your timing is. And that here. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Again, thank you for uh, convening this outstanding town meeting on this important issue at this critical time in the development of high-speed rail in America. The United States High-Speed Rail Association is a nonprofit trade association organized to mobilize the entire transportation industry and public service executives and others around the vision for true high speed throughout the nation. We've uh, had forums, seminars, meetings, and private discussions with uh, industry leaders around the world and also uh, leaders in public policy like yourselves and, and businesses, both small and large businesses, to expedite the procurement, 
and technology advancement and engineering for high-speed rail all across the United States. We are pleased to be here today. I flew the red-eye flight last night to get here uh, because this is such an important issue. It's been a busy week for me uh, on this issue. On Monday, I, I met with Senators Landrew and Senator Olympia Snow in Washington, D.C. to discuss uh, the small business issues as it relates to uh, high-speed rail. Unfortunately, there is no uh, DBE or small business requirement in the Federal Rail Administration. As uh, Assemblywoman Galgiani indicated, uh, that there was no federal leadership in this area. Uh, neither FRA nor Amtrak really have specific uh, DBE provisions uh, required by law. Uh, there are other agencies within DOT that do have federal procurement uh, requirements. Uh, the FTA, the uh, Federal uh, Safety Administration, the FAA, all have DBE requirements, goals, and timetables. But here we are sitting with billions of dollars allocated and yet to be allocated by FRA, and there's no specific uh, DBE provision. And it's very unfortunate, and the time has come to remedy that both at the state level and at the federal level. Uh, we are pleased today uh, to announce the creation of our first effort, uh, specifically targeted towards small businesses. Uh, the High Speed Rail Association is made up of over 250 members, uh, many of them the largest companies in the world uh, specializing in this industry, companies from Germany, from France, from it it Italy, from Spain, from China, from Japan, and of course from America. In my efforts to uh, understand the technology and advocate for rapid deployment of the technology in America, I realized early on that small business was not at the table. Uh, in many of our discussions and conferences, uh, small business has not uh, shown up in record numbers uh, and has, has largely been overlooked in the policy making on this particular subject. So today, the U.S. High Speed Rail Association has announced a small business database that we are uh, putting forth on our website to register and identify companies that have expertise in this area. The number one complaint uh, and excuse that's given when you are encouraging small business participation, particularly with international companies, is we can't identify uh, quality small businesses. I'm offended by that response, uh, and I do not accept that excuse. And so as a way to eliminate that, uh, we have uh, announced today the creation of this uh, small business high-speed rail database for contractors throughout the country, but particularly here in California. Because you're right, California is on the lead of this industry now. Uh, as most of you know, uh, Florida was a companion state uh, equally aggressive in the development of true high speed. But because of uh, a decision made by an ill-advised governor, uh, that project has been stalled. But Florida's loss will be California's gain. Uh, I was with uh, the Department of Transportation this week, and I spoke uh, directly with uh, uh, the Deputy Secretary and uh, the Administrative Officers and others at FRA this week and it was uh, fairly clear that the Florida money is going to be reallocated and California stands an excellent chance to get a nice large check out of the uh, FRA and the DOT in, in the weeks ahead. The bidding is, I believe, uh, open and available now and uh, I believe that there's uh, quite an effort in California to get a large sum of money and the United States High Speed Rail Association will support your application, as we have in the past. Because of the outstanding leadership that's here today, uh, particularly the uh, emergence of Roloff Van Ark, who will be testifying today, his expertise is globally known, and he's going to provide great leadership in this area. Uh, I also had the occasion on Wednesday to speak directly with the President. I met with President Obama myself on this issue on Wednesday, 
And uh, uh, he was very concerned about the actions of the uh, governor in Florida. And he and I both agreed that it really wasn't policy, it was politics that was uh, at the anchor of that decision. But be that as it may, um, money moves. And money will move in this instance as well. And California stands to benefit from uh, the decision made by the governor. And uh, I can think of no better state to get a large portion of that money than California because it is the only community in America proposing a true high-speed system. I mean a system that is state-of-the-art like they are in Europe, in Asia, in all the parts of the world. Uh, average speeds exceeding 200 miles an hour. Technology that embraces uh, this 21st century state-of-the-art ability to travel like uh, no one in America in America has experienced in the past. The other thing that makes small business important right now to America is that the number one goal for the Republicans and the Democrats, whether you're in California or Washington, D.C., is the creation of jobs. And small businesses open and provide more jobs than any other business sector in America. They also are frequently on the cutting edge of technology. Uh, I helped write the Telecommunications Act of 1996, and in that we had a small business provision to create a partial solution to one of the three problems that small businesses face in new technology, and that is the issue of access to capital. So technology is a very important feature of uh, this movement, and small businesses most often lead the way in technological advancements. The third and most important part of why small business matters is that we are approaching a very active and very aggressive political season uh, in, in the coming 18 months. And small businesses vote. There are 14 million small businesses in the United States. And uh, neither party can overlook or ignore the power of small business at the ballot box. So this is the time for the small businesses represented uh, in this room to make their interests known on both sides of the aisle, the Republicans and the Democrats. Let's not forget that it was a bipartisan support for small business back when another uh, elected official from California sat in the White House, President Nixon. He was a very strong supporter of minority business enterprise. People don't, don't recognize that. George H. Bush signed an executive order uh, promoting uh, small business and minority business enterprise. So, of course, did Bill Clinton. So the United States High Speed Rail Association is going to call on, and I spoke to him personally this week about it, signing an executive order by President Obama. Because we need his leadership in this area, he signed an executive order this week uh, designating the Northeast Corridor as a high-speed rail corridor in the United States. We, we appreciated that and support that move as well. But we do need presidential leadership uh, on this issue, and we need it now. Uh, I'm going to be wrapping up quickly. Let me mention that uh, the president is going to be here in California, so you will have the opportunity to speak to him directly. On April 20th, he'll be in San Francisco, and on April 21st, he'll be here in Los Angeles. So that'll be a great time for uh, people in this audience to speak to the president and address these issues with him directly and his other leadership that he's going to be traveling with during that period of time. Lastly, let me applaud the work of the California High Speed Rail uh, Authority in moving forward expeditiously in uh, getting the procurement effort for high-speed rail underway. But we have to include small and minority business in that formula, in that calculation. Uh, as some of you know, there was a deadline for expressions of interest filed with the uh, California High-Speed Rail Authority, and I'd like to ask for a show of hands of how many uh, companies here uh, knew of that uh, expression of interest deadline and filed. That's about uh, a third or so, or, or two-thirds, or about a half, maybe. 
between the third and the half of the people here uh, participated so far. I uh, encourage the uh, leadership of the High Speed Rail Authority to provide an additional period of time for uh, small businesses and others to file expressions of interest. Even though it is very important that this program moves forward, uh, we must take a, a moment of time to let the small business opportunities uh, catch up with the larger opportunities that are presented in this multi-billion dollar initiative. So uh, if you haven't filed your expression of interest, uh, I encourage you to do so immediately, and hopefully uh, the leadership that's here today will uh, permit a short period of time for expressions of interest to be filed and then move directly into the procurement process. I am uh, available for additional uh, comments and questions after the panel, but let me just close by saying there are three things to uh, look at in your policy and legislation. Uh, I've reviewed it personally. I think it's a great draft. I think it should be moved expeditiously uh, through the legislature and endorsed and, and implemented effectively. But after the implementation is where the most important parts start. Monitoring, oversight, and enforcement. The legislation itself will not produce the results that we all want. And the leadership at these tables have to pivot from policy makers to deal makers to really assist small and minority and disadvantaged women-owned businesses to really create opportunities. Big business happens all the time. They don't really need the type of encouragement that uh, small business needs to be active at the table. So I encourage you to continue with the legislation, pass it quickly, and then monitor it, oversee it, and enforce it vigorously. Thank you again for having me, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your comments. Uh, I think many of them sort of were directed to the choir here. Uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the important role of small business play and the opportunities that, that exist with this project. Uh, before, uh, before we go on, though, I wanted to just acknowledge I've been joined by two other colleagues, uh, Mr. Warren Fatani, Chair of the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, who's with us from the 55th Assembly District. Uh, Warren, you care for any comments? Thank you very much, Senator Price, uh, and also thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, the Tri Caucus, the African American Legislative Caucus, the Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, the Latino Legislative Caucus together uh, are working on this issue, not only in terms of California high speed rail, but the issue of involving communities of color in all aspects of contracting and business opportunities in the state of California. Senator, I would just briefly share that uh, I requested an audit from the state auditor last year with the Department of General Services to get a sense of what kind of opportunities we had and whether or not our collective communities were having an opportunity to partake of the different contract for services and goods that the state of California has. And unfortunately, the audit came back because the legislative base is already there. The laws are there. And Mr. Hart, like you so happily said, the issue of oversight, the issue of holding people accountable, that's the key. And what we came up with last year with the audit was that the state of California was not living up to the legislation that was in place relative to small businesses from the women's to disabled veterans, all of our communities. They did not have the contracts they should be having. So what we're starting in this process with a very important public works project that's going to be the biggest that we've seen in a long time to make sure that the faces that we have in this audience are also the faces of the people that work on this project. They have goods and services sold to this project, and that's what we have to do. So I see a lot of friends in the audience that uh, we've worked together in the past around a lot of different issues local hire, getting people hired locally to work on these projects. Even if we have to ship them up into the Central Valley to help build this, we're gonna make sure this happens because we're the ones that are gonna ride it, so doggone it. We're the ones that are paying for it, so doggone it. We better be the ones that build it. 
Thank you. We've also been joined by the co-chair of the Legislative Black Caucus, uh, the Honorable uh, Mr. Davis, Mike Davis from the 48th. Mike, any comments? Yes, sir. First, I want to commend our Senator, our Chairman, uh, Karen Price, for pulling together uh, this effort, which is <laughs> certainly critical, along with uh, another colleague, uh, Kathleen Galjani, who's dealing with the issue of high-speed rail. My areas of interest have always been diversity, but most specifically as it relates to this issue, I'm concerned about the implementation of federal policy in state jurisdictions, where in fact there might be some challenge and controversy with regard to the application of 209 as it relates to the federal policies that have been set in Washington about diversity. Who trumps who? Does federal law trump state law? And how do we resolve those issues and concerns? And so I look forward to engaging in this uh, effort and uh, us moving forward to uh, make sure that we can lay out a roadmap for diversity. Thank you. OK, our, our next speaker uh, is the executive director, the executive officer of the California High Speed Rail Authority, Mr. Olaf Van Ark. Uh, he's been in this position since June of 2010. In addition to this role, uh, Mr. Van Ark is a senior executive with more than 30 years' experience as an engineer and manager of some of the world's leading transportation companies. Uh, he's been asked to share his the historical perspective on the California High Speed Rail project, its funding prospects, contracting, and disparity issues, and the recently re released Request for Expressions Initiative, uh, and the draft contracting policy for California certified small businesses uh, that has been referred to earlier. And so, Mr. Van Ark. Floor yours. Thank you, Senator Price, uh, Senators, Assembly members. Thank you for putting this together. I am very glad to be here today. Um, many of you may not know, but I have seen Senator Price, I guess, five or six times, Senator, in the last uh, three or four months, uh, as well as some of the other tri caucus members. And uh, I can tell you, I am personally very committed to ensure that the Californian High Speed Rail authority will continue to be engaged with you and with the small business uh, people in, in the state. I would like to give you a bit of a, an update on the project. Uh, as you heard from my colleague on the right, Tom Sart, this is a real high-speed rail system. Um, today, this probably, and I think we've been doing that for all the time, leading the United States in trying to implement a real high-speed rail system. There's often some confusion in the United States as to what high-speed rail really means. High-speed rail in the United States is often referred to as high-speed rail anything over 100 miles an hour, but uh, ours is double that speed or more than double that speed, so 220 miles an hour is where rail systems are operating in a real competitive mode with other transportation systems. It is a system that worldwide is successfully implemented in, in uh, at least eight nations, eight countries, with whom we also have cooperation agreements, um, and where they are really successfully operating these systems in a cash positive manner. It offers California a long term economic benefit, an alternate transportation mode to the modes that we have today. For the growing population, which not I, but everybody estimates will grow about by 10 million in the next 25 years. It offers California also a short-term benefit, which is something that is coming at exactly the right time. You mentioned the dire need to improve the jobs position in the state, and there's nothing better than a, than a infrastructure project to get people working, to get people receiving an income rather than uh, living on social security, to allow people to spend their money, well-earned money, and to be proud of the jobs that they have, and thereby generate an economy and get an economy up and, and running again. There's no better time to start an infrastructure project than a down time than we've got at the moment in California. This project is a complex project. It's 800 miles of track between Northern and Southern California. 
It is for that reason that you often see a lot of negative statements in the press. There are clearly a lot of naysayers, but I believe as a percentage of the whole, they are not that large. There are many people that believe in the project, there are many people that are supportive of the project, and I'll say that after my nine months here uh, leading this project because I get a lot of support from a lot of people, a lot of comments and are very positive as well. Where are we today? We have the first five and a half million dollars to start construction. A decision was made to start the construction in the Central Valley. The decision was made based on us originally having four Arab segments pre-qualified, two segments in the valley, one segment on the peninsula between San Francisco and San Jose, and one segment between LA and Anaheim. High-speed rail, or very high-speed rail, if I can refer it to that, rail high-speed rail, is all about interconnectivity of people over long distances at very high speed. That is what it's all about. It is very important that the backbone of the system is, is built. The backbone of the system is the system in the Central Valley. Without that backbone of the system, there is no high-speed rail. <coughs> If we only built the main sections, we would be building commuter rail systems or interconnectivity where we pick up the passengers, but we would not necessarily be building the backbone of the rail high-speed rail system. So the decision to start there with 5.5 billion is a good decision for the state of California. With the new funds, as uh, Thomas to my right has already indicated the new funding becoming available, or the funding from Florida, their loss, our gain, it is a figure of $2.4 billion. Uh, the FRA announced, or the DOT announced last week Friday, that uh, this will go out on rebid, if I can call it that. We need to put in our application by the 4th of April for what we believe we could do with those funds. We will not be on our own. There is the Northeast Corridor. There are other programs in the country that will be bidding for the same $2.4 billion. We believe, as far as High Speed Rail Authority is concerned, that we need every penny of this money. Don't forget that the authority has always said we need $18 billion of federal funding. This is a long-term vision. This is a long-term project. It is not a small project. It is about interconnectivity between north and south of California, connecting metropolitan areas. So we will be applying for more funding. We understand from the FRA or DOT that after the 4th of April, the decision-making process will be very fast, and they will then get back to us, and hopefully the 5.5 billion will be more than that. So it is all about jobs, jobs and more jobs. You heard the statement about local jobs or international jobs. Now, I have worked for some of those international companies. I worked for them overseas and I worked for them in the United States. And I can tell you that the jobs that will be generated from this program will be local jobs. Firstly, more than 90% of this project is the infrastructure. And that infrastructure is so local, it can only be done by local people. It will be done by local people. It's just something you cannot necessarily do somewhere else. You have to do it locally. The 10% that is the technology-based portion of the contract, that means the trains, the signaling system, those minor parts, they too can be manufactured locally. They will be manufactured locally. And there will be companies that are in line for these. Many of them have local manufacturing facilities and have been committed to the United States with big numbers of local American employees. And I know because they have told me, and I believe that, and they've done so in the past, they will commit themselves again for high-speed rail to build what we need in the United States. Obviously, we must consider that the numbers, the quantity of what we require 
is going to have to be sufficient to make it economically viable. To build one train or five trains in the United States is going to be an impossibility. This is high-tech, state-of-the-art, something that you cannot just transfer without a huge investment in local manufacturing plant and technology transfer. So we must consider that to get a high-speed rail up and running, it has to be a long-term commitment. But it's all about jobs, and I am really convinced that there will be so many jobs related to an infrastructure project like high-speed rail that we are not going to be talking about whether we are employing the local people. It's going to be more a question of where can we get the people so that we can employ them because there's really going to be a demand on the local people. It is a local project, it's an infrastructure project. This year, 2011, is a very important year for high speed rail in California. Again, being the second spokesperson, Thomas Hart has said a lot of it already, but it is an important phase because there are people both here and in Washington who are not necessarily as convinced as we are that high speed rail should be built. And therefore, it is most important for those who really believe in these jobs and really see these jobs coming or going. If the project doesn't come, the jobs are not there. It is very important for everybody to consider that if you speak to the right people about keeping this project on course and keeping this project going. If the project doesn't go, California will not be generating the jobs that I think are so important for the state. So I would like to talk a little bit more about the topic of today. Uh, we at the authority have goals that are in line with the existing government's uh, executive order. We have had goals that mean 25% uh, small business participation and 3% disabled veteran business participation. We, uh, to, to this point, uh, since I have been on the project, you, I think you know, some of you know, that our authority is very small. We still have less, we have less, we have 17 people in our authority. For exactly that reason, I think you can understand that we are not the contracting authority in all instances, but we work together with DGS. I think many people don't know DGS, the Department of General Services. We, in fact, are the responsible um, state organization to do the contracting on our behalf or with us. I would like to also state, though, because uh, there has been some criticism about the authority, but on the most recently awarded contracts, that means the contracts for the last year, we did not award many contracts, but it was $18.5 million of contracts in the 2009-2010 fiscal year. We achieved over 27% small business and over 7% DVBE content. So we did meet and exceed the requirements and we continue to do so and will continue to do so. I'm personally committed, and I think again, Senator Price, our engagement on many occasions, I am personally committed to ensure the authority establishes a robust policy because our policy, as you know, we want to extend not to only state funds, but also to federal funds. At this stage, as you heard from Thomas, the federal fund, the FRA, does not yet or does not have a DBE requirement because there were never a, a, a lending authority or a, a, a grant authority. For that reason, we are ensuring through the policy that we are wanting to put in place and have put as a draft to our board that we will at least ensure that all federal funds will also be subjected to the same laws as those that are applicable in California. Well, we are eager to get any inputs, as uh, we have told everybody at our board meeting, to the policy that we have floated. We are working closely our small team are working closely with DGS, with Caltrans, with the Governor's Office, with GoEd, 
to establish the best practices. We have to um, happily lean on the others because they have a lot more experience than we do and they do have more staff than we do too to ensure that we can learn from them and establish best practices from them. Our goal is to ensure that we get the inputs and establish a good policy for this huge job. It has been referenced that we had an RFEI process. The RFEI is Request for Expression of Interest. I would firstly like to just ensure all uh, the public here today that the RFEI process, if you did not respond to it, it does not mean that you cannot bid or cannot participate in the project. An RFEI process is a process by which an authority like ourselves establishes firstly the interest in the project and secondly gives people like yourselves the possibility to communicate with us and give us your inputs, your thoughts, your comments, your concerns. And I would agree, as I had just been requested by Thomas Hart, whether those that have not yet submitted something that would still like to submit something, please do so. Uh, we did aim and we still aim to have a cutoff point on Wednesday, but we will accept any comments that come in later. The reason we had to put a date to the closing is because on April the 12th, here in Los Angeles in the LA Convention Center, we will have a forum, a feedback forum on the RFEI. And of course, to be able to establish it April the 12th, we, we need to be able to work on what we received and be able to give the industry feedback. And that's why we had the cutoff date. But I wouldn't like that anybody to feel that they have the cutoff. So please, uh, if you feel that you still want to submit something, do so. You're not disqualified if you did not submit. We did, by the way, ensure for the small businesses that they could submit an abbreviated response. We did understand from some small businesses that they felt that the questions that we asked were maybe too cumbersome for them to answer, being small businesses. And we did communicate to many of them through the channels that we had. But we are quite happy with a small response, a, a letter, uh, interest as well. And we would recommend that they do so if they still wish to do so. But any other comments would be much appreciated. Just where do we go from here? So the RFEI, then April the 12th, and thereafter we have approximately in the middle of the year, because we take the inputs from the RFEI, and we feed that into an RFQ process, request for qualification. And the RFQ process should be launched approximately in the middle of the year. In the middle of the year we would then, so you would get more documentation and you would see how you could uh, form or work together in, in groups to make this happen. And I can promise you, also on the April 12th uh, forum date, we will do, and as we are busy doing to all small businesses, we will reach out, we will do the matching of small businesses with the contractors. We will ensure that all the big contractors have introductions to your small businesses. We want to make sure, and I've done so in my life, I've been CEO of these companies, and I have hired and involved small businesses in my life in the United States very, very often. We will continue to do so. We will reach out, we will do the outreach to ensure small businesses and the contractors get together, and we will ensure during my time on this project that we will maximize the use of small businesses. Towards the end of the year, or in fact the beginning of 2012 is the time that we will go into the RFP process. So that is the actual bidding process, the request for proposals for, should be completed, should be ready to be issued by the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. And it is our aim to have the first contracts ready and signed in the beginning, second half of 2012. Again, I am committed to ensure 
if your health percentage of price certainly in Davis, Davis uh, certainly in London, pretty tiny, and others, but you are on the front focus that I've met with you to make sure that we work together to ensure that small business is involved in our very important project. Thank you very much. You mentioned uh, this RP process and, and also I uh, guess RP process, a matching effort. Uh, I think uh, many would, uh, would be concerned about uh, you know, what happens after the matchmaking. What's the, what's the incentive? What's the, uh, what's the um, follow up on, on making certain that uh, you know, there are some matches? Made and that there are some opportunities for contracting. I mean, folks don't want to just kind of go through a process to be matched up and nothing ever happens. What, what kind of assurances, what kind of project programs are in place to suggest that this is going to be a process that uh, will uh, have some real results at the end? Firstly, uh, we are aware of your three goals, and your goals, to some extent, uh, are addressing some of these issues. Uh, in that you're talking about some preference in evaluation, evaluation of, of birds. Uh, we would like to work with you, Senator, on uh, these goals and, and for you and ensuring the success of these goals. Um, furthermore, as soon as I can get my staff, sorry, I, I already have, as you know, a dedicated person, but one out of 17 is, is at this stage what I can, can afford. And we will continue, together with the support that we're getting from some of the other organizations, to ensure, monitor, and do the outreach and work with the industry to make sure that they meet our criteria. This is a project that will require a continuous involvement of contractors. If contractors do not meet the grade and do not do what they are uh, proposing in their bidding process, then we have the ability, because it will be back for more bids at the later stage, to use that, uh, that fact that they have not done so. We will uh, be uh, actively involved in ensuring that the, that the contractors are involved. I have mentioned this to, to you before, we must be cautious because there will be a huge demand on people in, this, in the state to actually meet the demand of this project. So, uh, and we will continue, together with the support that we're getting from some of the other organizations, to ensure, monitor, and do the outreach and work with the industry to make sure that they meet our criteria. This is a project that will require a continuous involvement of contractors. If contractors do not meet the grade and do not do what they are uh, proposing in their bidding process, then we have the ability, because it will be back for more bids at the later stage, to use that, uh, that fact that they have not done so. We will uh, be uh, actively involved in ensuring that the, that the contractors are involved. I have mentioned this to, to you before, we must be cautious because there will be a huge demand of people in, this, in the state to actually meet the demand of this project. So, uh, the question I have is, it seems like with a small staff and a small amount of money, <clears throat> and what you're saying is that the first data that's coming is one that does reflect your commitment towards small businesses uh, and uh, diversity in the sense of minority and uh, also women-owned businesses. My question is, but, you said that you're working on this, but there's still no policy that's been developed. Has this been brought before the board, and how come there isn't a policy yet by the board of directors? Uh, Senator, as you know, I can't speak for the past. <laughs> but uh, there was a policy, I mean, there was, there was, we worked according to the authority, we worked according to the, the law related to local uh, statements. Uh, but we have brought a policy, a draft policy to the board two months ago. And we have, in particular, not asked the board to approve a policy there and then, but asked in agreement with uh, our discussions with Tri-Corpus and others to leave it open for a few months for comment so that we 
we'll then bring it back to the board, and we're going to bring it back to the board in about two months' time for them then to finalize and approve the policy. But it is already available, it is published, it's out there, and we asked for comment, but I think that's the right way to go. Do we have a copy of that policy? It's in the packet? And it's on the internet, you can have paper there as well, so you can get to it. Open. In response Mr. to Senator Lowenthal's question, I would just add that um, Kermit Maddox, who is in the room here too, he helped us put together the workshop last March, and we had a conversation in December, and as a result, I contacted the director and asked that while they were planning to bring the issue up in February at the meeting, I made the specific request that a time be allowed so that others could come forward and identify best practices in other places in the state um, that could be looked at by the authorities. So that also is a, a big reason why they don't have a policy in place now, is by our request. Ms. Gray. Mr. Van Ort, wanted to ask you, you mentioned you have 5.5 million and you have a staff of 17. Have you issued any contracts yet? The uh, figure I gave you, Senator, was the contracts that we placed in the last year. So there were contracts placed three years ago for engineering work. Those contracts are still in place. How many of those? How many contracts? Uh, there are 10 regions, so at least 10 regional, plus uh, one, two, three oversights. So I would say 15 contracts, something like that. So 10 regional. And how many within each region, would you know? Uh, no, those were individual contracts. In other words, a regional contract. But would those have some contracts in those? So we have a lot of subcontracts in them as well. So total would be 50 plus? Yes. Yeah. 50 times one, or just 50? I'm just trying to figure out, you got 50 big contracts, how many subcontracts? Would no, you there imagine? would be about, say, 20 bigger contracts. And, but they have a lot of subcontractors and they have a lot of uh, smaller companies working for them. So that would be how many, do you think, how many contracts? You look at the big ones and the small ones. I guess every one of those would have 10 or so, so you have a multiplier of 10 underneath that. So 50 times 10, uh, 20 about 500, 200. 50, 200. about 1,000. No, about 200. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, and I, I want to thank Mr. Van Ark. After uh, the meetings the Tricaucus had with you, I wasn't at all of them, but several of them that you did share with us that a policy was being worked on, and I thank Ms. Galgiani for really being an advocate for the Assembly and the Legislature relative to this high-speed rail. Uh, but just in looking around the room, and I recognize a considerable number of people all of us have done this kind of work together, so we know some of the things that happened, and I'm not to be redundant, but in catching Mr. Tom, Thomas Hart's comments, sometimes the policy is critical, important, obviously, but the accountability issue is probably even more important. Uh, as I said, we just did an audit of DGS, and the policy to use small business is there, and they totally failed the audit. They weren't doing it. Stories where big companies, for example, for office supplies, would be the one to make the contract as the prime, and they had a whole bunch of subs underneath them. And of course, this doesn't relate to what you're talking about, Mr. Van Ark, but I'm just giving you an example relative to government where that contract would be let. And then when we look to see what, in fact, the, prime, the subs were, they really didn't exist. It was a paper kind of situation. And another thing, and this is one of the things that spurred the interest for me for High Speed Rail, was that somebody got the prime contract, but they got the prime contract by bringing together a team, and all of you have been on teams, and the team was very diverse, and everybody got marched in for the presentation. The contract was left, and then when the contract started to be spent out, then the prime did it all in-house, and all the subs were let go. So we know a lot of the teams, and I'm not referring it specifically to you at all. The well, point I'm making is that in terms of the policy, we need to look at the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's. 
But for us out here, the, the actual practitioners, we need to be really advocates and, and really eagle eyes relative to oversight to make sure that these things get done the way they're supposed to. We've seen it over and over where the small contractors, you look at, there's a, hundreds of them that get contracts, but you add up all the small contracts, compare that to the big contracts, doesn't compare at all relative to dollars. So I think that becomes, in many ways, the ball gets put in your collective court in the audience with your organizations to be oversight bodies as well to make sure as the policy gets put in place and you exert your effort and energy to hammer it out so it makes sense. But then what Mr. Hart said, I think becomes absolutely critical, which is the issue of accountability and make sure those policies are practiced. So we know that's the case in government. Oftentimes you have practices and no policy, then you have policy and then no practices, but they have to be hand in hand. Thank you, Assemblymember and the Senators. Uh, for brief, 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 very brief uh, comment. Uh, one thing, uh, Mr. Van Ark, I'd, I'd recommend that wasn't present in the Florida situation. Florida had a dismal uh, record in small business recruitment. Was uh, two things. One is that uh, it should be a part of the criteria in evaluating the uh, bidders in the RFQ and the RFP of their uh, small business uh, plan and program and record not just uh, you know generically, but specifically. So that should be part of the classification and the criteria in evaluating them. And uh, the U.S. High Speed Rail Association is also going to be monitoring and evaluating them on, on these uh, important points. And we'll be submitting uh, materials to you in our evaluation and to the members of this committee. Thank you. Since we're on the subject of how um, small businesses are cheated, there are a couple of other things that I'd like to bring up that are done by other agencies sometimes, and that is you have a small business that is brought in for contract, and before the work is complete, the prime switches out the small business and replaces that with another contract, and that puts the, the first small business at a financial disadvantage because they've made an investment already, and it's done under the guise of a change order, as I'm told. Um, and then secondly, uh, <clears throat> the second issue is that they don't do timely payment to the small businesses. And so uh, the small businesses don't have access to as much capital, so when they're not paid for several months and they're starved out, they're, again, they're put at a real disadvantage. And we happen to know that with the federal dollars anyway, we will be reimbursed. California Beef will have to put the money up front, but we'll be reimbursed immediately there should be some requirement that the primes make payment to the subprimes immediately because if we're going to be paying them quickly, they ought to pay the subprimes quickly. Um, the, the whole issue of accountability and transparency is something that obviously Tri Caucus and others are very concerned, concerned about. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what's in place to help inform, uh, keep uh, uh, potential businesses advised and, and uh, up to date on uh, what's coming up? What we've done at this stage, and it is again because of the lack of the, sh of, of the size of our organization, we are trying to work together with, with Caltrans uh, and EGS, even though maybe the record is, is not that good, but with other organizations who have done and have got more staff than us to reach out. Uh, we are trying at the moment, we are wanting to uh, work together with a, uh, an expert in this field, somebody who understands it better than most, so we are busy trying to contract with an expert in the field to assist us as well, to be able to do better outreach. So we're starting ourselves, it's going to be part of our organization as we move forward as well. But again, we are limited obviously by the size, pure size of the organization that we have. But I agree with you, transparency, I have mentioned to you, I say again, I am committed to make this work. And, and I agree, I heard it 
By the way, uh, Assemblymember Gargiani, let you know, I have personally got involved in quite a few incidents lately. We as a state are not always that good at paying, sorry to say, but uh, that we have ensured that our small business subcontractors, their small business subcontractors, get paid. So that the small business subcontractors, I know, and I've done this in all my life, that a small business subcontractor cannot survive unless they get paid because they do not have that cash flow possibility that big companies have. I've personally been involved in quite a few of those situations because we know how vulnerable these small businesses are. But the transparency is going to be important. Uh, I am committed to make it happen, and it's going to be part of our organization. Thank you. Let, let's pivot for a minute to, uh, uh, there were several references to Caltrans uh, in, the, uh, in the presentation. Uh, next up is Ms. Uh, Olivia Fonseca, Deputy Director of Business and Economic Opportunity uh, at Caltrans, uh, the Department of Transportation. Uh, she's responsible for ensuring small business and disadvantaged businesses uh, participate in the contracting activities. Uh, and uh, we're asking her to comment uh, on the 2007 Availability and Disparity Study uh, that was uh, received by the Department and the action that the Department has taken to address these issues. Uh, hopefully, some of them may be uh, applicable and uh, transferable to the high speed rail program as well. Uh, uh, Ms. Fonseca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for um, you can hear me. Thank you very much for asking me to attend, and I thank the uh, honorable legislators here for taking your time for you to listen to the issues of small businesses. Again, I'm Olivia Fonseca, I'm the deputy director at Caltrans on the Office of Small uh, Business and Economic Development. I also want to share that I have a passion. I only have sh uh, 30 short years of ensuring small businesses, minority women, and disadvantages businesses have an opportunity to pursue all state government contracting, which includes corrections I was in their uh, new prison construction program. I, what I want to share with you as you've asked is that we talk about the 2007 disparity study that was conducted. And on May 9th, 2005, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals issued a ruling, uh, which was a Western State Paving Company versus the Washington, Washington State Department of Transportation. It issued, um, a ruling saying that Washington State did not have evidence of discrimination in their transportation-related contracts. So with that, Federal Highways issued a guidance to us, uh, State Departments within uh, the Ninth Circuit, that unless we had evidence of discrimination in our transportation federal aid program, we were to cease any race-conscious activity, which is placing in identified transportation DBE go on contracts, and uh, go into a fully race-neutral uh, program, which is no goals. We're asking the prime contractors to voluntarily uh, utilize minority women and disadvantaged businesses. Not having the evidence of discrimination, we commissioned an availability and disparity study in 2006. Caltrans determined that the, the disparity study was very much needed to justify a continuance of uh, receiving the federal highway funds. The purpose of the disparity study is to identify the existence and scope of uh, disparity and discrimination in public transportation contracting in California for the federal highway related funds. In order to continue uh, receiving those funds, uh, we hired uh, through a competitive bid process a firm by the name of BTC Research and Consulting. They completed the study in June of 2007. And that study, which is 562 pages long, is available on the Caltrans website. BBC, during their study, uh, did uh, contact thousands of small businesses, minority women businesses, for their interest in transportation-related uh, opportunities. We all, they also looked at the, uh, over 10,000 past uh, contract records of their utilization uh, on federal highway projects. There was, uh, as a result of that, that study and surveys that they did, there was evidence of disparities for constru both construction and engineering for both prime contracts and subcontracts to, again, minority women and disadvantaged businesses. This disparity was across the state of California and was not limited to any one area, region, or district in California. Depending on the type of contract, disparities between utilization and availability of these goods were more severe for African American, Asian Pacific American, Native American, and women regardless of race 
or ethnicity. The disparity study also identified barriers to entry for minority and women in job-related construction and engineering industries. So not only did the disparity study identify disparities in business contracting, but also disparities in job opportunities within the highway-related contracting opportunities. So as a result of the study, uh, Caltrans determined that the more appropriate goal at the time, again based on the study, was a goal of an overall goal of 13.5% for DBE participation. We also had to determine within that overall goal what portion of that 13.5 would be towards race conscious activity, which is where we place an individual contract goal and identify that the only firm or the only groups that may meet that race conscious goal were those where we found disparities. Again, those firms that we found the severe disparities were for African Americans, Asian Pacific Americans, Native Americans, and women. We obtained a waiver from the U.S. Department of Transportation to be able to apply that race conscious goal for those four groups that was granted to us in August of 2008. With that approval, we were then able to immediately enter into a setting individual race conscious goals. But let me share with you, prior to having to move into a fully race neutral program because of the Western State Rule, we were uh, achieving about 11, between 11 and 14 percent DBE participation. From 2006 until 2009, when we returned to a race conscious program, our participation, which was wholly race neutral, which is more of an aspirational approach, was about 1.9 percent participation, which, shares, which shows to you that the need for a race conscious program, the need to set an individual contract goal, it's very important in ensuring minority women disadvantaged businesses have an opportunity in highway related contracts. What we did as a result again of the study is that we identified some barriers that businesses were telling us as to why they were not able to even be certified as a DBE. One of those was the certification process. Although certification is a required um, step and procedures established by federal highways, we sought out opportunities to streamline the application by assisting, for instance, truck, only, truck operators who are not generally uh, available to set at a desk and fill out applications. We were able to set uh, up workshops so we practically filled it out for them, ask the questions, and then make sure that they understood they had to follow up with the documentation. We also enhanced our outreach. Outreach, as we shared here, is a very important aspect of ensuring minority women and disadvantaged businesses, and I would say disabled women, have an opportunity to know what is available. So we uh, identify uh, outreach events that we hold on a quarterly basis to identify again what is coming up in the pipe, three months away, six months away, one year away, so that our small businesses have an opportunity to prepare, be ready, and identify the resources for that. For that let, let me ask you this for a second, just to summarize. Okay. Uh, the others that uh, we did is we hired a consultant to do the business uh, development and outreach for us as well. We uh, uh, also have, uh, as an important part of this, as I heard here, is job opportunities. Uh, Caltrans was able to obtain at least $3 million from federal highways to, uh, as a grant to issue uh, or provide training, on-the-job training, to uh, those potential workers that will be working on our federal highway projects. In, in uh, summary here, or in conclusion, I'd like to add one other item is speaking about the transparency. One of the items that Caltrans did as, as well is <clears throat> we post our, bids, our bid results and all uh, minority women or disadvantaged, disabled veteran uh, listed firms on our website. So after the bid opening, Within four days, anyone, any, anyone would like to look at it can see who the uh, prime contractor listed to meet the various goals that we have in place. So with that, I mentioned about the disparity study was completed in 2007. It is time for us to update that study. And we will be doing so with a, another competitive process of hiring a consultant to update our study. The audience that is behind me, I ask you, and, and your, uh, your need is very much needed to assist us, Caltrans, in identifying all the available minority women businesses who do transportation-related work to stand up, be counted, and that assists us in identifying those disparities. 
that we need to remedy. And without your um, acknowledgement of your existence, we continue to have lower goals and lower attainments. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Hey, next up, uh, Ms. Tashi Smith, the Director of Diversity and Economic Opportunity for LA Metro of LA County Metropolitan Transit Authority. Uh, and we've asked her again to uh, discuss uh, uh, the approach that's been taken by LA Metro to deal with issues related to disparity and opportunity. And again, we're asking the panels to to hold your remarks to a minimum, about one or two minutes at a minimum. We do want to get to the town hall part, and that's to hear from you. And so I uh, just appreciate your patience uh, and your cooperation. Uh, Ms. Smith. Thank you very much, Senator Tyson, and the officials for inviting MTA to participate in this town hall meeting. I will be brief. Um, MTA is a direct uh, recipient of FTA funds, and accordingly, we are required to comply with the DOT Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program. And as Olivia mentioned, uh, there was a, a federal uh, court of appeals decision that impacted the DBE program that stated that <coughs> Uh, the local, although at the national level the DBE program met the, uh, the constitutional scrutiny, the local uh, recipients had to ensure that we have evidence of discrimination uh, uh, to uh, allow us to remedy uh, that through contract goals. So essentially also MTA did the same review that Caltrans did and uh, found that we needed to conduct a new study. And so uh, uh, through a competitive process, MTA engaged uh, BBC Research Consulting to conduct a study. Uh, our study was um, a um, consortium of uh, several agencies, which was uh, uh, Metrolink, Orange County Transportation Authority, the San Diego Association of Governments, and San Diego MTS. Uh, each agency did receive a separate disparity study report. The uh, findings showed that there was disparity in MTA contracting uh, as compared to utilization and availability. The study showed that there was uh, statistical uh, disparities for the groups of Hispanic Americans and also women of all ethnicities. Uh, the study showed that the uh, groups of African American, Asian Pacific American, subcontinent Asian and Native Americans were at parity with availability within the MTA contracting market. What does that mean for us now? Uh, currently, MT, uh, staff is preparing a report to the MTA board uh, to set a new uh, overall DBE goal of 20.9% based on the availability provided in the disparity study. We are uh, presenting to the MTA board to reinstate race conscious goals based on the study findings for those groups that were shown to have disparity. Uh, we also have um, looked at our small business program um, in that sense to uh, be more inclusive. Our board is very committed to small business. We have many projects going forward with our 3010 and Measure R, and our board wants to ensure that small businesses uh, uh, participate. And so with that, we uh, within the last year, uh, thank you to Senator Price who sponsored a bill for us uh, to uh, expand our small business program, uh, which was signed by the governor and was made effective January of this year. We are now we now have the authority to apply our small business program to our public bid contracts that were uh, previously voluntary. So now we can set mandatory SBE goals on those projects. Uh, we are also increasing our personal network requirement on our small business program from two that we can uh, take another look at um, Metro's contracting process within the race neutral period. What we are finding is that um, 
based on, as Olivia mentioned, in a race-neutral environment, there is still a need uh, to remedy discrimination in the contracting market. One thing I wanted to mention is that when Prop 209 was um, issued in the uh, late 1990s, NTA looked to implement an SBE program, and at the time we modeled it after the DBE program. The DBE program has very good enforcement and monitoring procedures, a good certification uh, guidelines and requirements, and so we use that as a model. However, we're, we're able to also expand that, and that program is much more flexible, uh, so that we can look at other best practices and find a way to be more inclusive. Uh, we also um, included in the SBE program small business preference as well. Thank you. Any questions? All right, let's give uh, this panel a hand, and I hope the two will have a chance to stay around. As our next panel is coming up, I uh, just want to uh, welcome uh, a student member, Stephen Bradford, who's joined us from the 51st Assembly District, Chair of the Assembly uh, Select Committee on Procurement, as well as the, uh, the Standing Committee on Utilities. Mr. Bradford, you come Mr. Bradford? President of the National Association of Women Business Owners, Commerce, including past president of the Los Angeles chapter. Certainly a, a, a strong component to the small businesses. And uh, we look forward to your comments. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Price. Uh, first and foremost, I want to uh, thank you and your uh, legislative colleagues for being here today and taking the time to. Uh, continue to address the issue of small business procurement and, um, and from our perspective, one of the key elements of that procurement is small business certification. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to make my comments very brief because I don't want to be redundant, and I think everybody in this room is extremely clear that this is a very important subject, and a subject that we have been talking about, it seems like in perpetuity, to not much impact or results. The recent economic meltdown made one thing abundantly clear, the role of small business as it relates to employment and economic development, not only in this region, but across the country. As the two big to fail firms in every single industry has demonstrated over the last decade, and certainly in response to the economic turmoil, they will take in their profits, they will shed their employees, they will essentially you know, move their economic activity offshore, they will abandon us in our time of need. What is left in this region and what is real, and what we all know, is economic activity and employment is driven by people like me and many of the people in this room. We employ your neighbors, we employ your constituents, we employ your family and your friends. It is critical to our, to, to our ability to thrive as a region that we actually make progress in the area of public sector procurement, particularly when the rescue to the faltering economy has come principally from public sector activity. With all due respect to the previous panel, I cannot imagine hearing that we are capable of building a California high-speed rail system and not capable of solving the problem of small business procurement. To Assemblyman member Dirtani's point, it is not a matter of policy, although I am so grateful for all the work that, is being, that has been done and that is now being done to reinforce and to advance the policy agenda. I would seek to add to that agenda um, certification reform, because I got to tell you, as a small business owner, it's really easy to get discouraged with the public sector procurement process. You don't have time to track the bazillions of, of hearings, of meetings, of outreach meetings, or 
to apply for the various certifications to make sure you've got the right one, to make sure it's up to date, to know you have to make money now. And quite frankly, you very often just do something that's a whole lot easier than this process is. Also, as it relates to procurement, some decisions have to really be made around this issue of bundling. As long as my money is dependent on the goodwill of a mega firm, I'm at risk and at jeopardy. There has to be a way of either making sure that that conglomerate, that mega firm, is really interested in, and as a matter of their own corporate, corporate values, promoting women and minority-owned entrepreneurship. And you need to then look at, when we score, let's score more than how they put their team together. Let's look beyond that. Let's look at the kind of contracting that they're doing outside of their public <coughs> contract. Because it's hard for me to believe that somebody that isn't doing business with women and minorities as a part of their general way of doing business is all of a sudden going to do right by me or by that sector of the, of, of the business marketplace in the context of federal procurement. That said, most small businesses are really looking for opportunities or ways that government might begin to directly contract with a smaller segment where if you're going to have prime and subprime, they're still for contracts that are less than the mega contracts that are likely to be left by the California High School Rail Authority. The other thing that I would, would ask you to look at is your metrics for success. <coughs> what I know is that the executive director of the California High School Rail Authority has as his principal metric of success building a rail system. In business, what I evaluate people on, what they get paid for is what they do. And time and time and time again, it's nice to do outreach and small business procurement and contracting. And there's a form to fill out, and there's going to be a hearing and oversight. But there are no consequences. It is not what we're evaluated on. We've done a great deal of work over the last year or so at the federal level, working with Senator Snow and Landry. Um, and among the things that they are looking at in the federal government is beginning to have as a part of the evaluation metrics for those people in those agencies who are responsible for procurement, meeting the goals that are set forward. And I would suggest to you that as a state, we begin to have as a metric that impacts people's ability to be compensated, to be advanced in their professions, meeting this metric, we'll do a whole lot better than we're doing now. Again, I, I, I'm going to stop talking because I know you've got uh, the rest of the panel and, and, and other participation to, to take in, but I so appreciate, Navo appreciates, we all appreciate what you're doing, and we believe that progress can, in fact, and will, in fact, be made in this area if you just stay on it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Darlene Noir, Chair of Communications and the Steering, the steering Officer of the California Business Associations. Um, I just want to state for the record that we all know that California is the only state in the nation to have passed a $9 billion high-speed rail fund to build a system. So I know, we've heard, you know we have concerns about money, about this and that, but the people want this high-speed rail, all right? Um, so what I always practice and always advocate is that the high-speed rail is also to build, to connect communities and to develop economical centers. Uh, a small sample of a transit village is one in Fruitvale in Oakland. So if you look at that, visit that, you can see what, you know, what the high-speed rail can do to our communities. Um, one, I always believe that it should be California first. Um, I noticed that the last 10 years in um, other states, non-residents, non-California corporate headquarters, all right, um, have given money back to California as much as they take it from California. Um, why is that? I, I never understood that. Why can't we look at our own firms first? And then if our firms do not have the capacity, they would be able to, you know, they have other firms outside of California. 
well, unless you want to give back, you know, 10% of your profits or uh, educate our small business or mentor our first in the next 50 years, I think that we establish a practice California first all the time. Example is when we deregulated um, electricity, we let firms come in from outside California, like Enron, and when firms like Enron are allowed to cherry pick, okay, uh, bigger firms for profit, and now Enron's no longer around. What's, um, so, you know, this kind of practice um, doesn't work and has not worked in the last 20 years. So it's time for a California return on investment. California has the highest number of small firms in the United States. The definition of a small firm in California, as SB, all right, is less than 100 million or less than 100 employees. But actually, we know the majority of small firms are less than 25 employees and less than $2 million in gross revenue. So a better method maybe is have different contracts of different dollar amount set aside or especially set for small firms under 2 point million and less than 10 employees. This kind of concept, the concept can fit different firms of all sizes and according to their industry. What works for one industry may not work for the other. Okay, when we, uh, what's happening now is our bigger firms are right when they're competing for other California firms for job, they're taking small contracts. So now the results is that we have less firms, empty office, vacant neighborhoods, more unemployment, etc. We need a well thought out program with those designed for small firms. Thank you, Mrs. Market. To summarize, please. Well, I can say that this is like other firms, and one of the suggestions I like to uh, suggest is that we practice some of the methods like P3, where we have private, public, and partnership, all right? Maybe that's one of the ways we could solve our problems of funding. Um, ever since the news on the high speed rail, everybody from all over the world wants to get a piece of the action. If we have them come here and get back to California, all right, what they expect to gain from California, or even get back more, all right, then we can have the funds for it. Okay, California would be where it is right now. The other thing I recommend is a small business advisory council, like Caltrans has. It should be representing people of color of different regions, of people who know and experience of diversity in public and private procurement. These public uh, these meetings should be open to the public and follow the public rules and notice. We should stop issuing new contracts and follow the federal regulation. 49 Part 26, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. If we have one dollar of federal dollar into the program, then it becomes a federal program. If we want the federal funds to come through, then we have to start now. So we should start issuing, issuing contracts at this time. By the way, when we're talking about issuing contracts, I'm kind of alerted that a firm like Parsman is one of the big primes, yet they come in also as a subprime. So I didn't know you could do that. All right. So it's, I don't know what we're doing, like, you know, use the stable boys again and again and again. And that's a practice I don't think we want to be known as. Um, I want to remind everyone that discrimination is still against the law. A program should have an oversight committee or partner with other numbers for outreach, tracking, enforcement, and so on. All right. I'm glad that, uh, that we spoke of uh, uh, not paying for it some time change orders, okay? There's even a little booklet going around and how to get your subs to get stress, like not returning the phone calls and so on, and they pass on to other contractors. And this is subtle discrimination, where it doesn't matter if you're a person of color or male or female, so it's like who do you like or don't want, and that is discrimination that's best. Goals should be established at the beginning, not at the end. So I don't understand how we could talk about we're going to outreach, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, when there's no goal set, all right? Go is a measurement, how you measure yourself, and if you exceed your goals, then you did well, you still have them back. Unmoking contracts is creative thinking. Okay, they'll say, oh, the firms are too small, can't compete, all right? Don't have the capacity. 
Well, whose fault is that? It's the fault of what? We let other firms, primes, and so on take our business and not giving them back. So probably creatively, to try to talk us and come up with something that could put some, uh, not commands, but strong recommendations all right, to help Californians. And then we should establish a program for vital businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I'm asking the uh, final two panelists to uh, be brief in their remarks so that we can get to the comments uh, from the audience. And we have next up Julian Canente, uh, the past and current president and chief executive the Chief Executive Officer of the California Hispanic Chambers of Congress. Uh, of course, I also want to thank the, the staff at High School Vale and at DOED. I saw Director Ayala here somewhere from DOED uh, for all their briefings that they've given the State Hispanic Chamber and our team uh, in regards to High School Vale, where the funding comes from, what they're looking at doing, et cetera. And also to Olivia Fonseca from Caltrans, for all the hard work she does with many of our local chambers throughout the state in, in getting opportunities out to them. Um, I'm here for one reason, one reason only. And that's to make sure that our Hispanic businesses, our emerging businesses, along with my colleagues, get their fair share of what is going to be probably the largest infrastructure ever in California. Um, and they deserve, it, they, they, they deserve to do that and get that, that fair share. And we're fully supporting 100% of high speed rail. We'll be back in Washington convincing a few other uh, members of Congress that they are wrong in their positions in the Central Valley and that they need to come on board and support High Speed Rail in California and for what it will do to turn around our economy here in California. Uh, in February, the State Chamber addressed the High Speed Rail Commission uh, in regard to the small business policy. We made the, the following comments. Number one, we felt because it was such a large project in California that the goal that they should strive for should be higher. We shouldn't settle for 25% of small business. We should surprise strive for a higher goal. And part of that goal should be specific to microenterprises as well. And Senator Price, thank you for your, uh, uh, your preference uh, legislation that you're introducing now in regards to microenterprises. We also told them that there needed to be a reporting mechanism that held everybody accountable and that was transparent. Basically said when, what, and who, and how much was spent with who, and, and, and with businesses throughout California. Um, and we also felt that any small business policy needed to be enforced and extended to the primes, and that they needed to be held answerable to the High Speed Rail Authority as well. And we also stated that there needs to be an aggressive outreach policy to minority women um, and disabled veterans. And I know everybody starts going out 209, and I shared with them SB 1045, passed by Senator Polanco back in 2003, which basically signed by the governor basically stated, and I can't remember the government code section was chaptered into, but basically said that outreach is legal and that every state agency and public contracting, and not only state agencies, but all government um, um, authorities um, need to do outreach in regards to public contracting and, and employment to minority communities and there was not a violation of 209. Um, so I, I, I would hope you know, we would look at that as we, as we proceed. Uh, further here. And more importantly, a part of that aggressive outreach program out to our businesses, utilizing our ethnic and minority chambers and business organizations and trade organizations out there, we need to educate our businesses on the process. So often, we give them the contracting opportunities, we let them know the business and the price, but we never tell them the process, and nobody shares that process with them in regards to contracting. And that needs to be a big part of it. Um, to summarize, you got it. Finally, I'll summarize with this. We can do all we want to certify businesses and outreach to them, but we need to build the capacity of our businesses to be able to participate in the contracting opportunities. We need to provide access to capital. We need to uh, provide for uh, uh, transfer of, of technology, et cetera, so that our businesses can be qualified. We can certify all day with every agency out there, but unless they're qualified to do business, they won't get the contracts. And I, Truly think that's where we need to start concentrating as well um, on in this. I, I truly believe that any small business policy needs to have all the stakeholders up there and discuss what's available out there and, and how we can make this uh, a benefit to all the California businesses. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, last but not least, uh, we have Drexel Johnson, founded of the Young Black Contractors Association some 17 years ago. Uh, with the mission of uh, leveling the playing field of black contractors and other boys. Mr. Johnson. 
Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator <laughs> Price. I appreciate uh, your asking uh, me to come out today, and thanks to the rest of the colleagues up here and my colleagues here. What we've had over the years is a situation where I don't know, you don't know. Outreach hasn't been real. The people that have been hired by most of the GCs to, re to do outreach, how long are their arms and what direction do they know to reach? In other words, it can't be in-house outreach. That's the number one thing. The number two thing is what uh, Assemblyman Portani said about the general contractors having such uh, a control on the contract once it's gone before the hearing committee, if you will, and then dropping people. If, if people allow themselves to be dropped, then so be it. I encourage people, contractors, to get with a good, strong trade organization and an attorney, and preferably us, but if not, just get with a good trade organization and let, let people know that you're serious. You have to let people know that you're serious, but when you look at people talking about certification, black people have been certified for a million years, and everywhere we go, somebody got a son and dance for us, telling us what we can do. At this table, we don't look for old, don't, can't, and ain't. We're looking for can do. And can do is looking for you guys making the legislation right. And the legislation is much like what has happened here with Expo Phase 2. I appreciate what the supervisors have put in the specifications. The specifications tell the story. When the specs are right and they have to be followed, that's how we go to work. That's how we got a chance to be on part of Skanska's team as they went forward for the Expo Phase 2. The other thing is, um, Fortune 500 companies, the CEOs are making an all-time high in terms of their pay scale right now. But they're not sensitive to the small guy. They don't care about the small guy. So if this thing ain't going to be worked from the ground up or grassroots, if you will, it's, it's not going to work. It, it's never going to work, and that's why it hasn't worked. That's why you don't see people looking like me on the projects throughout L.A. City and L.A. County right now. You're not in the CLA. You're not in the TSA, you're in the wrong union, you live in the wrong district, you live too far, your zip code ain't right. But the contract is all the way from New York. I mean, it just doesn't make good sense. It doesn't make good sense. We, we have the organization, we will not accept that. So when people talk about all the different things about what can you do, what can you say, do you want to roll over and play there, that would be the quarter of project. I, at the time as a contractor, was the only full-time, local, black, union, minority in the whole job. And it was $18 million worth of work. But the project was $2.4 billion. Why couldn't any black people go to work on the project? We had legislators that looked like we looked. We had people on the transportation committees that looked like we looked. We didn't care. We let Ron Tudor of the Mid-Corridor know. We're going to let any contractor know that comes in here to build that we're going to be a part of this team. Now, I listened to the gentleman from the High Speed Rail talk about what they've done thus far with the various 10 teams. The various 10 teams, approximately 200 companies over three years, these are the guys that set the tone. Yep. Your architect and engineers are behind the scenes knowing what's going on, and they relate to their people, their contractors, their GCs, their attorneys about what's going on and who needs to get where and when and for how much. That's what's going on. My first point of contention to try to do a contract basis as a director is to try to get my contractors that fits that mode in terms of architectural design and engineers and design build, get them in front of the phase of the job at the very beginning. That's why it happens then. They can make more happen than not. And that's why we're all too often left out because our people are just not out in the front. President Barack Obama said American Recovery and Reinvestment Act dollars, stimulus and infrastructure was to be followed. If you want to work, follow the money. Measure R, $9 billion, high-speed rail project. If you put popsicle sticks together in Los Angeles County, we're going to work. If you build a, a red wagon, we're going to work. We're not going to be denied. To summarize, to summarize, there's not one black contractor doing natural gas pipeline work in this state right now. Not one. There's not one contractor that's black on the 1% of work. Black contractors do less than 1 17th of 1% on highways, bridges, railways, airports, seaports, underground. We must be in the game in the very beginning or it's not going to work. Thank you. Okay, now it's time, uh, now it's time to hear from you. We appreciate your time and taking it. Come on up. 
We're going to ask uh, everyone to look at their comments in two minutes. Office of Economic and Business Policy, and I'm joined here with my colleague, Linda Smith, who's the Executive Director of the Center. Um, we're going to focus on two key areas in which uh, we talk about outreach, but outreach is so much disconnected from the actual con contract procurement process. Until those two par parts are joined together and it becomes one congruent working force, the outreach person is outreaching for public relations purposes. It is a job to be able to make, them, make it known about the opportunity. But what happens after that? You know, who's tracking what really goes on afterwards? And is, are the contracting officers involved in that process? Um, having a robust, a robust contractor supplier database is okay. But if contractors are not being used out of that database and they're not being able to, that's where we want to see that and have it be transparent so that we can all be able to participate in the process. Thank you very much. I'm Linda Smith and I want to kind of tag team off of this. Uh, what we have is a great deal of outreach that's not turning into contracts. So this outreach needs to start at the very beginning before the bid happens. Part of the evaluation process should not be what the contract inclusion is with the bid, because many speakers have already told you businesses get included in the bid package, they don't even know it, or they get dropped after the contract is awarded. The evaluation process should look at past performance of that prompt. What is your past performance? And that should be in the bid practice. Um, I think that. When I first came to the mayor's office three years ago, I spent a lot of time looking at small business programs in other parts of the country because my constituents wanted it. They didn't want a race-based or a gender-based program because of Prop 209 and they understood the limitations. What I found by looking at six or seven cities is not a panacea. It's not going to be automatic that you're going to get the inclusion of the businesses that need. Half of the cities had great numbers, half of the numbers went down with minority and women. So you really have to put a robust program in that has that tracking. Final, the last ball of defense is you guys who are approving these contracts. When your procurement managers bring contracts to you with low participation, they need to be turned down. And when I talked to cities that had good small business programs, they told me the real deal. That's what the last wall of the fence was turning down those contracts. Finally, bond assistance and contract financing is much needed because if you don't have bonding, you don't have capital, it doesn't do you any good to have a contract. Thank you. Good comments, both of you. Thank you. Before people start to leave, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that the first step with contracting with the authority, while the whole process isn't put together, we'll be signing up on the Department of General Services contracts registry and I'm trying to get the internet site to announce to everyone, but that is a, a first step that's very important um, as we go forward. It's a name uh, organization. Uh, uh, my name is Eddie Lau, and I represent Nation American Architects and Engineers, and also Associated Professionals and Contractors. Uh, since 2006, the, the California High Speed Rail Authority awarded 10 contracts to large in architect and engineering firms. In broad selection, environmental engineering, environmental impact assessment, and preliminary engineering of the project. The fee for these contracts amounted to slightly less than $1 billion repeat. Less than 4% of the work went to small business. Based on high-speed rails reporting to the Department of General Services for only half a billion dollars. So we have half a billion dollars not even caught, not being uh, accounted for. Now, the, in the high-speed rail re reporting to the DCS, they said, Due to the highly specialized field of high-speed rail systems, many of the services contracts have been awarded to business with worldwide offices or companies that have experience with high-speed rail. Basically, they say, we don't qualify. Um, you look at how much work the small business done for Caltrain, has done for Bank, and some of BTA, LA Metro. Now, this document was signed by the procurement officer, Rachel Winnegar. 
Okay, right. So I, I question the sincerity of the of the high speed rail. This person has recently appointed by the high speed rail as the small business and DBBE advocate. So what are, what kind of message do you send out? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This is very important to all of us, and, and it's good for you. My name is Robin Turner. I own Archaeopaleo Resource Management. I am the only combined archaeology and paleontology company in Los Angeles County that is FTE, WPE, DBE, underutilized, micro, and WOSB, right? Uh, certified. <laughs> and i got to tell you, you guys need to, I mean, you know. The high-speed rail people need to go with what Metro's done and stop reinventing, you know, the wheel because they've got a great DBE uh, program. What I'm talking to you today is I've been in rail for 25 years. I and I did some project or I did the high-speed rail for four years on the Los Angeles to Anaheim segment of uh, during the EIR process. We got taken out so that they could put another big company on. The biggest problem there there is there is that they're not using small businesses. They're using companies that are from out of the country or out of the state, and they're and they're they're just saying they have a quota for small businesses or whatever. But it's a percentage, not a dollar amount. And that's what I was hoping today you would go and talk to everybody about. I'm, I lost out on over, well, I didn't even make a profit. I lost money by working with them because they didn't pay through the Prompt Payment Act of 1999. And our entire six uh, company group from that section, we lost out on a million dollars, over a million dollars of prompt payment penalties because they, the High Speed Rail Authority did not pay us on time. I'm now, my building, my commercial building's up for sale, and I'm just possibly... Please, it's I'm not, I'm not going out of business, but I'm, I have to completely downsize because I have to put out loans and have a second on my house to pay for the authority's project. The only other thing I wanted to say is, is not only... Not, Make sure you have, uh, if you have large firms, they're from California. There's a lot of wonderful talent here. There's a lot of wonderful small talent, small business talent. We need to use that. Number two, pay by the do dollars, not by percentage on the small business. And um, and, my, and the third thing is, like I said, use Metro's, stop reinventing the wheel. Use Metro's DBE and, and minority plan. It works. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator and distinguished panelists. My name is Rick Williams with Mary Weather Williams, and this will be two minutes right under. Uh, I'm a small business owner in the state of California who, like many other business owners here, would like to participate in the state's largest public works project. Although the high speed rail project's goals for DBEs and DBEs is 25%, the number really should be higher, somewhere in the range of 35 to 50%. However, many small businesses, whether they are SBEs or DBBEs, there can be no meaningful work if certain tools are not in place to ensure that these businesses get work. The biggest obstacle to the majority of the companies desiring to get work on the high-speed rail project is the 600-pound per in the room that no one's discussing seriously as bonding and outreach. I strongly encourage the high-speed rail governing body to employ a bond and outreach program to ensure that all small businesses can secure work on this project. There are bond programs currently in place in the state of California, both in Northern and Southern California, that have assisted small businesses to the tune of $400 million in bids and securing close to $200 million in contracts. The economists have determined that within our community, the dollar rolls over about six times. If we can take $200 million, roll that over six times, we can infuse $1.2 billion in our community. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for your comments. My name is Robert Vanek. I'm a resident of Los Angeles and lifetime small business owner. I've been lucky enough to grow some of my small businesses to larger businesses. I want to thank the four of you for staying and being serious. Uh, and I want to start by saying, I think one of our challenges here is the gap between lip service and, and real work. And the four of you are giving us real work. Concerned that the rest of the panel's gone, and many of the speakers are gone, and I think that's part of our problem here, is that the, the gap between the intentions and delivering the goods aren't really here. Um, I've got some bad news, and the bad news is we're all being tricked. Uh, in the draft 
of the California High Speed Rail Authority's policy. There's subtleties in language. They have to make an effort. They strive to. They endeavor. They encourage. And they make best efforts to include the participate, participation of small businesses. I've got a confession about this. When I became a big business, and I was at the table with other engineering and architecture firms, talking about who was going to be subcontractors, I got nudges and said, oh, Bob, don't worry about it. We can just send out letters to the small businesses, ask them for their ideas. The small business ideas come up to us. We can list them, and we never actually have to hire them. I was disgusted by it. It is absolutely of epidemic proportion in the state of California, in the city of Los Angeles, and, and America, and mainly because everybody's hurting. Okay, big companies are hurting. To get a job in a big company, you can also a job in a small company. They're good people trying to hold on to their jobs. So what's the solution and what's the opportunity? About a year ago, a group of architects, engineers, and Los Angeles business people formed a coalition called Rail LA. We're a group of small business owners, architects, planners, who know that this high-speed rail project won't just create jobs in the project, but will have a profound, lasting effect on the economy, creating a ripple effect of jobs in all kinds of new businesses, from entertainment to hospitality to new transportation. That number, that bite, is bigger than just the project itself. So we started getting together a year ago. Now we're a nonprofit, and we're, we're trying to get more interest and a cooperation. People want to contact you. Uh, who, who should they? RailLA.org. R A I L L A dot org. RailLA.org. So, so for my closing point, here's the yes. opportunity. Roll up that arc and the High Speed Rail Authority have a chance to do it right with us. He's not saying they're not going to do it right. So we have a chance to do this right, and we can't make anyone the enemy. We've got to bond together and make this happen because the opportunity is big, and if we have an abundance mentality, we can do good on this one. Thank you. Thank you very much for Thank your time. Thank you for your company. And just a follow up, you referenced the, uh, the policy, the draft policy. It is a draft. It's still taking comments on it, and again, you're encouraged to take a look at it, uh, review it. Uh, if you have specific uh, comments, Certainly, you should send those to the identify John yourself. Sharp, Operation Hope, Small Business Program Manager. First of all, I want to thank you, Senator Price, and Senator Davis, and everyone on the panel for actually staying and giving us all this information, which is very much needed in the community. Uh, I have one comment and one question. The first comment is we need to simplify the certification process. If we can do that, we'll open up a lot more doors for people who are unaware of the process, for people who are unfamiliar with the process, people who have difficulty with the process. Also, that web address for the filing of the expression of interest, we definitely need that. We can get that before we go. It's, uh, you have it? Okay. Is it in our It's uh, www.hsr.ca.gov. Hsr. Can you repeat that again, please? This is information on the expressions of interest. Yes. Uh, that deadline has been extended. If you have an interest, uh, it's still possible to register with the authority. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sheba Workers Local 105, uh, uh, construction worker and organizer. I uh, want to, I know this is focused on small business, but I'm just going to put comment on the issue of employment. We have, if it's okay, there are a, uh, there's something called network hiring. We, we spoke to earlier where people are hiring based upon family connections. Uh, and in LA, we have people who live next door to projects who cannot get work even though they fit in the zip code specific and broad. Uh, that needs to be addressed. The issue of people being hired and then subject to on the job site discrimination, laid off in two weeks, so you wait for months to go to your apprenticeship program, pre apprenticeship program, get hired, get laid off. There's no, pro there's no protocol to follow up or to verify if there's been discrimination or some issues that need to be addressed. Uh, that's when people come and figure their career, get a two-week job in the back of the streets again. And that's the real problem. Um, we, we like that. Thank you. 
Good afternoon and thank you. I'm Sharice Bellamy with the Grant Communications. I understand this is primarily a construction or infrastructure project. I just want to know at any time during the project, will there be any opportunities for a service firms such as advertising, marketing, and public relations? Absolutely. And you should express that interest with the authority. Excuse me, I'm sorry. And you should express that interest with the authority. Yes, there will be more opportunities. Thank well. you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Diana Lacombe. I represent National Conceal of America and also the Associated Professionals and Contractors, known as APAC. Uh, just a couple of brief uh, comments. First of all, we support Senator Lowenthal's bill to get rid of everyone that is on the current authority board and replace them with people who have the skills, the background, and who are people of color that represent us, not the existing pro pro, pro quo. Secondly, uh, when, when you in the Senate especially are uh, approving the appointments of uh, the uh, directors for the state agencies, please be extremely conscientious of the Caltrans, the uh, Secretary of Transportation, Business and Housing, and make sure that they have the DBE experience to be able to, to actually implement it so it doesn't take a year to try and catch up with everything. Uh, lastly, I know Assemblyman Gail Piani has a bill you know, uh, for small business and the high-speed rail. We've submitted comments to it, but my recommendation today is this. We can't wait around for all these bills and amendments and everything. Go with general services and Caltrans, what's in, what's in existence. Because of the, otherwise, we're going to be losing money till heaven knows when. So, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you for your Good afternoon. My name is Fred Jordan. I'm the president of the San Francisco African American Chamber of Commerce. But I'm also chair of APAC. APAC represents about 35 minority and women-owned organizations in California. We were formed around this high speed rate because we saw nothing, absolutely nothing. And so we stood alone, and I want to thank you, Senator Price, Senator uh, and thank you for coming to San Francisco, Senator Price. We now feel that we have something to move. Let me just say this quickly. I've been around, I've been in practice for over 30 years. I did have the opportunity to work on the Northeast Corridor High Speed Rail Project. That involved 300 firms. And every time it went through a community, it involved local participation. And your bill, Senator, is right on in terms of involving people color, local, small businesses. Let me continue. Uh, Van Art, the executive director, said that this is about jobs. It's more than jobs. It has to do with contracts. That is the way you get jobs into our communities. It's a award contract with small, minority, and women-owned businesses. Then you say, what can we do? As Eddie Lau said, the train has left the station. One billion dollars of contracts gone. That's all of the engineering and environmental work. It's gone. But you can you can go back and pull out certain parts of that project, the stations, and still get some action. Because when it goes to the design build contractors, they have their own team. It's gone. We want to stop this project until the issues are resolved. We have money coming from Florida. That's fine. We're going to hold up that money until we get this resolved. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Wright. I'm Deputy Executive Officer for Diversity and Economic Opportunity for LA Metro. You heard from Tasha Smith this afternoon about our small business program. The only thing I'd like to share with the panel is you have to reach in before you can reach out. And until you make your executives accountable for small business participation, 
participation, your programs aren't going to work. So what we've done at Metro, we created what's called the Small Business Shared Responsibility Program. So all of our strategic business chiefs have a goal put on them. And if they don't meet their goals, then it affects their performance, which affects their money. And you'd be surprised how we're getting all this wonderful participation that we didn't have before. So it's very important to so that so much. What is that program called? It's called Shared Responsibility. Shared and what we do, nobody wants to come in last, nobody wants their name at the bottom of a of, of board saying they didn't do. So this way, it is not just the practitioners who carry the weight of answering the question, why did you meet your goals? It's everybody's responsibility. So uh, I'd like for you all to consider as part of your monitoring, your oversight and enforcement, make sure your execs that run these programs have a responsibility. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say for anybody that hasn't applied for the RFEI process yet that wanted to, I don't know how easy it is to find it on the actual website, but if you want to bring me an email, I have it on my cell phone and I'll forward it to you. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Janice Bennett, Opportunity Marketing Group. Um, I've been a small business in Los Angeles and certified by uh, MTA for about uh, uh, 20 years now. I have pre-qualified to uh, work on the RFEI uh, present with my transportation quarter, and hopefully I will be awarded one of the contracts. I would like to say that uh, I have been supported by the Transportation Department uh, working on government agencies. I've worked with the county and the city, and we're in a building that I built on my first career, going right now, the California Science Center also the Stable Center. Um, I know that the, the main part of uh, community outreach, contract compliance, uh, equal opportunity, has to do with the prime contractor being in enforcement. Uh, if we don't get um, companies that will enforce what the government has set forth in the contract for us, the participation for DBEs and WBEs, uh, our program all fall, and that's why the community can't see that we're doing anything that's going to be constructive. Um, so the government needs to, if you send money here, you need to know where this money is going. And if you don't have an agency or a consultant or a firm that will enforce that the contractors hire from the community, give contracts to the community, and the small businesses, we're not going to succeed. But um, I think the transportation idea and uh, what's being set forth presently is going to help all of our community. We just need the opportunity to cut the red tape to get to work. The money comes, but we don't get to work. So the main thing is we can cut some of this in between about being awarded the contract after it's uh, applied uh, or sent your uh, PN. Uh, that's the only way we're going to get ahead is to make the process speed up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to give honor to the California High School Rail Project. Uh, my name is Stephen Sherman. I'm a 90-year-old World War II disabled veteran, and I have a small business, Sherman City. <laughs> but anyway, I just like to say that uh, I'm on a high-speed uh, chase to try to get part of the American pie while I'm here. I see that it'll be finished in 2022, and I don't think I'll be able to count that out. But anyway, I just want to thank all of you for what you've done, and I uh, hope that I can take part in this, in this uh, high speed project and uh, <coughs> just remember the Sherman City Thank you. My, my, uh, I would just like to say that uh, I have a wonderful partner named Gloria Shelton. I think you know her as Enterprise. And uh, my email is SSHER1457 at AOL.com. Thank you, sir. <laughs> My name is Alan Lee. Uh, I'm a neighborhood rep for the Central Neighborhood Council. Uh, my proposal is to uh, is to build the uh, the, the high speed trains for them uh, because I I I work from a Boeing aircraft. We build C-17, and so there's a lot of us who are retired, and I uh, and we have uh, engineers, I mean planners, I mean inspectors, and mostly planes were built here anyway. 
And so we like to pass down, I mean, that technology, I mean, to our youngsters. And, uh, and we have what we call the, uh, the uh, Slauson corridor, uh, and that's an industrial corridor between uh, Alameda all the way up to uh, Prince Charles Boulevard, and we don't have, <coughs> excuse me, any industry in the industrial corridor. So therefore, I mean, th that would be nice uh, to have, uh, to build a bullet train right down Slauson Boulevard, I mean, in the industrial corridor that don't have any industry, and we can also build uh, 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 wooden mills I mean, in town because we need some activity in the industrial corridor. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Leonard Loomis. I'm the president of the National Association of Monterey Contractors and the owner of Loomis Air. And uh, one of the things I'd like to reiterate is the importance of not bundling these projects. Uh, and there must be uh, mandatory oversight enforcement in penalties when contractors not fulfilling their obligations for hiring. But another key fact I'd like to bring up is one of the things that kills minority contractors is the requirement for union participation on these jobs. What kind of participation? Union. union. Most of your micro businesses are non-union contractors. And there must be some latitude to allow us the opportunity to be a part of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Ami Nkalili. I'm with the G Crew, TGC, a construction management, project management, and inspection services company located in Glendale, California. Uh, I want to first and foremost thank all of you for conducting this town hall meeting and giving the public and the professional community an opportunity to voice their issues. Uh, I wanted to reiterate what I heard from some of the representatives and panelists talk about, and that is, as much as there's good outreach programs to allow small businesses and minority and women business enterprises to participate in these programs, there needs to be a better uh, accountability on the part of the crimes. Uh, if the participating public agencies that are led to these contracts provide that opportunity so that small businesses can deal with the projects directly rather than teaming up with the crime and dealing with some of the problems that you heard concerning the relation between the soft and fines, uh, it would be much better. I wanted to especially give kudos to Metro's outreach program. We are beneficiaries of that and we have teamed up with some tremendous opportunities ahead of us, but yet we are not hearing about those crimes where those opportunities come up and that seems to be a common threat in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Troy Hightower. I have a small renewable energy business, and I'll try and be brief. But I'd like to thank you, the town. This is very important. I'd like to encourage you to consider having more of these type meetings. And finally, if you do that, to, as others have mentioned, outreach, education about the high speed rail, I think it's essential. I've been very involved with it, I know a lot about it. Once more people know about the benefits and opportunities that one lady mentioned about advertising, there's over 260 categories, wide categories. So education, more public meetings, and I think. All right, thank you. I, I just had a question for the gentleman. Sir? You see a renew renewable energy company. I'm just curious in what capacity. A uh, large solar and wind. You're doing solar and wind, and where are you doing that? And mainly in Central California. So you have purchase agreements already with some of the utilities? Uh, that's good. I mean, I'm the chair of utilities, and my biggest challenge is that I've seen not a single person that looks like you walking in talking about having contracts. And I was just what I uh, brought to President Peavy uh, this week as it relates to RPS. So I'm encouraged by that, and I would love to get your information and make sure that there are more folks like you that are doing this work. I appreciate that, and I, I would agree with you because I'm the only other one I've seen. Well, <laughs> you're the first, so I'm glad to know that you do exist. One of the reasons I'm doing that is. It is a policy of high speed rail that we're trying to run it 100% So we're going to try and do one. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Stephen Glover, uh, Chairman of Commons, uh, Chairman of uh, California Community Connection. Our need is, is, is on the job training. If we can get some funding for on the job training, it would be great. Uh, we're doing a career aware today on April 7th. We probably already have information. We'll have up to about 2,000 kids. 
the reason one of the reasons why we're doing it is because of the 2.1 million jobs coming, our choice is to either raise them or they're going to import them. We want to try to raise them. We need to have opportunities for our youth because somebody's going to have to take that choice. So I thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Senator and Senator, for having us because uh, without an open dialogue, things can't change and you will get lost. I thought I was going to be the last uh, person, but uh, I think you got one of the couple more. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I think everything I would have said has already been said. I want to just say, first of all, uh, I represent the uh, San Joaquin Valley Black Contractors Association and the Kern County Minority Contract. We are on ground zero, right in Central Valley. Uh, we're going to try to coordinate a forum like this with the Central Valley. But I want to say very thank you for our elected officials that have taken interest to represent us and fight to see that uh, small business is going to be included. And I would put a shout out to those that are listening in the audience. We need to support our elected representatives that are fighting for us and giving voice to the people. The senator has a bill that's going before the assembly. He's going to need support letters and people going there and support what he's trying to do because he can't, they're not going to be able to fight for us effectively if we don't do our part to help them to help us. So that's my challenge out to each of us. So again, thank you very much for being here. And I believe we're going to make some waves. And I'll say the last thing. In my own community where I live, uh, the number three person in the state in, in the House right now is Kevin McCarthy. He and those uh, other representatives that are in the Central Valley, they are trying to kill the money for high-speed rail. That's why we need to be very important in supporting folks that's going to push and make sure that we're going to be included. It's very important to be involved in the process. I just wanted to say that again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Price, uh, Assembly Lady Bradford, I want to thank you again for uh, having this forum. I'm Bob Durrahim Amid, I represent the National Association of Black Contractors. I want to thank Brother Gretzel for being on point, making sure that we keep things out of the forefront when it comes down to African Americans. We know this money is going to come up and down the state and go as fast as the high speed rail. Our concern is that we're going to be able to get on the train and make sure that we get our feet in the forefront. So what I'm saying to you today is that the uh, San Diego uh, uh, branch or arm of this high speed world would like to bring the same form to San Diego to wake up the folks and give them, make them conscious of the opportunities. I want to encourage you to keep us in the forefront. We have the tools that are in place. The brother talked about unionization. We have alliances with the unions. We have the only African American state and federal approved apprenticeship program in the country right here in California. We'd like to make sure that that program employs African Americans who are going to be the builders of tomorrow. Our contractors are going to be on the high speed rail, will be out there on the tracks to make sure that we get our share. I appreciate what you're doing, and I want to give a shout out to thanks to Dretzel and Brother Johnson and Brother Marvin Dean, our uh, San Joaquin chapter, and as well as some of our Inland in Empire chapters that are uh, speaking to the political leaders to make sure that we get our share. Thank you again. Thank you. Senator, I appreciate it. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Timothy Jones. I'm with Advanced Communication Technology, M3 Construction Services Incorporated here in Los Angeles. Um, relatively simple person, and I really came here to listen rather than to speak. Um, but one of the things that did catch my attention was the recent uh, information request about the request for expression of interest. Um, in our company, I have a young lady that is our estimating engineer, a recent graduate of USC engineering school. Um, I had recently pull up, go to the website, pull up the RFEI uh, for the high speed rail project. The young lady looked at me and said that this was more difficult than completing a PhD dissertation. dissertation. Um, I think the reason I'm speaking right now is that that is just one key element that I think that politicians kind of hear a lot about, but you really don't necessarily get your hands or your eyes on exactly what it is, what these hurdles are that any of the contractors, the primes, uh, architects, and development firms are placing before small businesses. The whole essence of being able to have a dollar amount set forth or a participation goal, it's been stated in many different ways as to how we think it might be fair in order for it to be done. 
If you're looking at a $43 billion potential contract, it might be really simple to say if you want 25 participation, you've got the small minority owned businesses. Of that $43 billion, 25% would be about a billion dollars. It's not difficult math. Bottom line is that what we're hoping is that you will listen to what's said, but my last comment is a question. From this board that you've held today, from this town hall meeting, what do you expect to do tomorrow? My question to you is you have all of this information. It's been said for over 20 years. What will you do with this information? When you do, will you, will you let me know via my cell phone, via your website, via any medium that is available to any of the people that were here today, what will be the outcome of everybody's time spent here listening to the same people say the same thing that they've been saying year after year? And I really like this one. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for your for your comments, uh, just to respond uh, briefly, I mean, this is the first in a series of meetings to shed some light uh, and, and to shed some accountability on this very important project. Uh, we're, we are going to be the eyes and ears that those of us on this panel have an intense interest in. So we're going to be monitoring uh, what happened with this agency, the funding, uh, the, the programs, and the policies. And again, our purpose of having this town hall meeting was to hear from you get your ideas, get your input. Yeah, some of it has been said before, but I think it's important to say it again and to refer our commitment uh, to making certain that uh, this project really does reflect the business community uh, in our state. I, I just want to echo uh, first thank Senator Price and stress his seriousness on this issue. Ms. Galtiani, who we consider the leading expert in the assembly on a high-speed rail. And I'm here today because um, I'm serious about diversity. And I chair the Select Committee on Procurement. And as previous speakers have stated, in my 18 months in the legislature, I've held a series of these hearings about diversity. I just had the PUC chairman in front of me on Monday asking why diversity is not greater in a lot of issues areas of the utility industry and also we've had hearing on bonk hearings in san francisco where senator price and i participated as well as commissioner simon asking about the unbundling of contracts we understand the hurdles and we just had drexel and many of the black contractors three weeks ago at southern california gas bringing them to the carpet and making sure that they make sure their contracting processes are ease, so to speak, and, and make it more available. So we're serious about this, and, it, and we're just starting this. But I, I spent 12 years as a local elected official, and even in the city of Gardena, we're finding we're going to have to legislate sometimes, too. But as a young lady stated, we don't have time for a two-year bill process or a one-year bill process. We want folks to act today. So that's why we're having this hearing. And we know money is already being spent on this project. And people like you in this room are not part of that discussion. So that's why we're here today to make sure we let the folks know with high-speed rail, with the federal government here in the state, we're serious about making sure people of color, women, minority businesses, disadvantaged businesses, have a seat at the table and have opportunity to do work, not just in this project, but with utilities, with corporations, because what we've seen is a lot of good effort, but no results. And what we've seen is a lot of training for small businesses, but no contracts. So we're seeing quit spending those millions of dollars to train minority and disadvantaged business on how to do work and then not give them contracts. We're saying give them contracts and let them prove themselves. Let's start with the premise that they're qualified. So we've seen we got qualified. So this is why we're here. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to add, uh, Speaker Karen Bass is now in Congress, and I had done the hearing back in March with Kermit Maddox, and the bill that I have now, AB 1206, um, is largely a result of what I learned at that at that workshop um, and going forward and then taking pieces. I take the careful notes. Someone commented that there needs to be a small advisory committee associated with it. There are other things that I've taken note on 
that um, as I go back and look at developing more of the oversight and accountability piece of, of legislation that I will take into account and consider. So know that 1206 came out of the first workshop. Thank you. Again, I just want to thank um, uh, everyone for coming out uh, this afternoon. Special thanks to the staff and the responsible for uh, making this town hall. Lisa, Lisa, Sarah, uh, and the Sheroes who signed uh, signed in. Again, you know, we know it's important to distinguish policy versus practice. I think that point was made over and over and over again. It doesn't matter what the policies are, if the practice isn't right, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's right. And also, and, uh, but we want to make sure that uh, everyone is fully informed, that the process is transparent, and that there is accountability. So, uh, again, this is the first of a series of, uh, of hearings, uh, town halls, meetings, etc., talking about the opportunities, talking about the obstacles, trying to figure out if there is a legislative uh, solution necessary, is it just a policy uh, approach that they can, they can change. But it's important that you be informed, that you be involved, that you be engaged. And uh, just as the um, the authority uh, has is starting this process now, ex getting expressions of interest. It's imperative that we participate in that process. Uh, it's imperative that we go on the list and that we participate in the programs and projects and that there be accountability. And so our pledge to you is that we're going to be accountable. Uh, we're going to make sure that the process is accessible, uh, that it's reflective uh, of the business population. So again, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for coming out, including you, James. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and our Chief of Staff, Curtis Ernest, thank you, Chief. Uh, but this, uh, I think, has been a good start. It's not the end. It will be a, a continuation uh, of, of our oversight, of our commitment to make sure we follow through on this. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.